Just waiting for the notice to go off. Right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first History and Heritage virtual conference. We hope it will not be the last by any means. We've got an electric selection of presenters this afternoon on a wide variety of topics, all on the theme of recycling. And uh, this is very, very topical. And I know that our friends in Glass Futures, uh, who are busy beavering away in St. Helens, um, are very keen to promote the recycling of glass. So without more ado, could I ask, uh, introduce Colin Brain, a fellow chartered engineer for his sins. Uh, Which are many. Uh, who has done work in all sorts of different areas. And Colin and I have had a number of different little discussions on the effects of iodine and uh, bromine on melting glass, etc., etc. So without any more ado, Colin, uh, over to you. Thank you, Bill. Right, let's see where I can share my screen. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you can hear me okay. Given the title, I thought perhaps I should produce just one slide and reuse it for the rest of the presentation, but I thought that might not go down too well. So instead, um, what I've done is picked out a few fairly random examples of reuse and recycling um, spread through the ages. I want to start by looking at the recycling bit and spend the first half of the presentation uh, looking at, at what's been involved in perhaps some different kinds of recycling and what the motivations might have been for it. And then go on to looking at some examples of reuse in glass over a fairly wide spectrum. So let's start with recycling. The two pictures here, which at face value look fairly similar. And, and in fact, they were excavated um, from archeological sites within hundred meters or, or several hundred meters of each other. Um, but they're, they're um, differentiated by at least 1500 years. The one on the left is a pile of collet from Roman London, um, part of the big um, hoard of collet that was discovered in an excavation. And in Roman times, glass making and glass working um, were completely different topics, so that the glass worker would be used always to receiving glass, either in ingots that are prepared elsewhere or in broken glass. Uh, they wouldn't have normally prepared glass from materials at all. Um, so one can speculate that being able to remount colour or broken glass was almost essential if they were going to overcome the vagaries of um, transport through the Mediterranean and uh, up the channel to this, this country. So they would be looking for recycling um, to continue their businesses, perhaps when new raw glass wasn't available, um, to continue employment of their craftsmen and um, to continue supply of, of vessels because at this stage, um, vessel glass was becoming an essential part of civilized life. Turning to the one on the right, 
at a much larger scale, um, although superficially looking similar. Uh, this is ground cullet adhering to the inside of uh, the wall of a, a crucible from the old Bedlam glass house. And this is right very late in the 17th century. Um, here, the, the glass house was producing all kinds of glass. And so recycling was part of a, a suite of, of techniques that they would have been using. And in this case, you can see that there is clear glass and amongst green glass. So effectively, this is downcycling uh, of, of glass rather than recycling at a common um, level of quality. So the, these are the, the, the two extremes that I, I want to talk about uh, briefly this afternoon. And um, first of all, first challenge I want to pick up on was the problem of collecting it. How did the manufacturers get it back to remelt it? Um, and I, I found an interesting quote. I'm not sure where it's from, but in Roman glass times, peddlers collected broken glass and exchanged it with the manufacturers for sulfur, which they yet then used for producing matches. So here you've got really quite a complex um, cycle of activities that turned broken glass into sulfur, into matches, and in due course, into remelted glass. Move on now to the end of the 17th century, and there are records that many hundreds of poor families keep themselves from the parish by picking up broken glass of all sorts to sell to the maker. Sadly, in this period, there were a lot of poor families who needed to be kept from the parish, um, given the changes in, in agricultural land and enclosing. Um, unfortunately, the urban poor was very much in evidence. And it's difficult to, to, to know how true this was, but one thing that, that is apparent is that at the end of the 17th century, somebody was collecting up a large amount of broken glass because um, very little of it got buried. Uh, for example, if, if one looks at Jamestown in America, which by British standards would have been considered a large village, there's probably as many late 17th century classes being excavated in Jamestown than in the whole of London, which was probably four magnitudes um, larger than, uh, than Jamestown was. So the process of collecting broken glass must have been quite efficient. Um, so if you've got the broken glass, what do you do with it? And there's a couple of of quotes here from the 17th century. One was talking about um, the cost of various things associated with the glass house. And um, here we've got for one who pulverizes the substances, it's called a pistator. Um, so what we're dealing with here is breaking up the substances and in, including in, in that, I assume, um, the recycled glass was very much a manpower activity, uh, which might be uh, fun for a short time, but I'm sure it wouldn't be in the long term. But go on relatively few years, and we start to see in an inventory this, these next ones for the mill and the millstone, six pounds, and for one mill horse, three pounds ten shillings in inventory. I'm surprised that the, uh, the mill horse was worth uh, as much as the mill itself. Um, and likewise, with the cost of hay, oats, and shoeing the horse at a different uh, glass house um, a few years later. So here we're seeing the start of the Industrial Revolution, where 
um, me mechanical means, in this case, animal powered initially, but going on for steam powered um, machinery is taking precedence over manpower, both to reduce um, costs and to increase the productivity that can be, be achieved. The third challenge, which I think is, is more of a challenge now than it was then, is alkali loss. When you reheat glass, there's, there's a tendency for alkali loss from the surface. And this strange looking picture was me trying to um, lixivate and refine wood ash from glass furnaces. In fact, um, at, uh, at Corley, the Roman glass makers. And basically the process didn't work, but I learned a lot in, in doing it. It's often the case. Uh, if it's not successful, you actually learn in the process. And what I realized was there's virtually no alkali left in furnace wood ash. And when one thinks about it, there's a good reason for that. The inside of the furnace is covered in alkali. The outside of the pot is covered in alkali. And likewise, the inside of the pot is properly covered. And so in this period, Recycled glass possibly increase the alkali content because of the alkali um, transferred from the wood ash. Move on uh, to the use of covered pots or um, coal firing or gas firing, and the situation is considerably changed. And alkali loss usually has to be replaced by additional alkali added to the batch. The next one, the next major challenge is iron contamination. If you look at the picture here on the left, you can see iron stains that are left actually in the joints of the, uh, the glass from the use of iron tools. In that situation, there are three things that the glass makers could do. One of them was to not worry about it, to just recycle, um, leaving the iron stains in there. And the graph on the right, um, which relates to work done by the late uh, David Watts, um, shows an indication of the iron content in glass towards the end of the 17th century and into the 18th century. And you can see, if you look at the, the axis at 1680, that within a few years, the amount of iron in glass increased approximately tenfold. And this is where people were reusing the, um, the glass without getting rid of the iron. However, not everyone took that that view. And this um, particular picture of a, a, a glass knockoff um, is within uh, cross polarizers, it's making a cross polarized strain viewer. Um, and the classic Maltese cross pattern uh, shows us that this piece has never been annealed. And the fact that it and many like it ended up in the Thames, suggests that this particular manufacturer um, discarded these uh, waste pieces uh, rather than recycling them. And almost certainly that's because of the iron in it. Um, the third way um, was to employ some of these poor people that I mentioned earlier that uh, was sadly too prevalent at the time uh, to chip away the dark stains from the glass so that they could actually reuse it in high quality glass. And by the, the time this piece was discarded, 
uh, presumably the manufacturers had decided that that was uh, a too expensive process. When I was preparing this talk, I thought it would be ideal to be able to show an example of what was almost certainly um, a recycled glass, warts and all, or in this case, um, iron stains and all. Um, and I happened to buy this one a week ago. So hence the stock press uh, label on it. Um, and it's a probable example of a lead, a mixed lead crystal and non-lead crystal glass. As you can see with black uh, iron inclusions, um, blue gray tinted with many small air bubbles um, or blue green tinted. The blue probably looks like um, a touch of added cobalt. And I suspect that this was because the lead glass was decolorized a little with cobalt and the green glass was a natural um, iron green of the uh, non-lead glass. Where this glass was made, I have no idea yet. It may be French, maybe English. It could be Irish or made in the Netherlands. Um, but the, the whole question of where glass is made starts to be blurred in recycling because there was clearly an international trade in broken glass. So that, for example, this might have been made in, in France because the um, manner of the construction is probably more similar to, to uh, French glasses. Um, but the glass from which it's made uh, could have been English and shipped in bulk out to France for, for remaking. So I hope that's briefly covered um, the, the subject of recycling and some of the challenges and some of the achievements that that has achieved over the years. So let's move on to um, reuse and starting with stained glass. Um, a subject of which I know lamentably little, but um, this particular example is of windows that were deliberately damaged by Cromwell's forces during the Civil War. It's not in keeping with a Puritan ethic. Um, and this particular one was rebuilt using um, surviving fragments from these windows um, and some well, from um, other churches, including, I think, Salisbury Cathedral. And it's interesting to look at what the motivation for this was. But the initial motivation was probably a need to keep the weather out. Um, but Clearly, there's a lot more than that. And I suspect part of this was a need to hanker after the, the time when these actually represented familiar, comforting icons of saints that had survived, in most cases, for more than the lifetime of the people who worshipped in the cathedral. And so they're aiming to, in this case, um, to reclaim a lot of the, um, oh, the, the um, connections the glass had with the past and impact in many people's mind at that stage, probably a better uh, past than that under the Puritan rule of um, Cromwell during the, uh, the post-Civil War period. But it's, it's, um, it's interesting to, uh, to speculate on the motives, but it still portrays the glorious colors 
that the um, stained glass artists achieved, even if it doesn't uh, give the um, pictures or the, the, the familiar icons of the saints that they originally intended. Moving on now to another um, source of reuse. These are two 17th century uh, glass stamps that clearly have been reused. And in this case, um, the, the people doing the repairs were probably window glaziers because the, the lead work on them and soldering is probably um, familiar to someone making glazed windows. The stem on the left is probably around the, the middle of the century that that one was made. And in this case, it's a, a repair that looks as though it used the parts of the same glass. But other repairs um, there uh, clearly are an amalgamation of more than one glass. The one on the right is somewhat older. The glass itself would have been clear and the, um, uh, the amber colour is from its uh, burial in, in C. And in this case, you can see that the repair is done at the foot and almost certainly would have been a repair that joined the stem and bowl of one glass to the unbroken foot of another. Um, when we first came across one of these repairs, um, many years ago now, we kind of assumed that this was a one-off um, done by um, an itinerant uh, craftsman. But gradually it's become apparent that more and more glasses are repaired. And I think that my latest guess is that it, about 5% of glasses that are excavated have been repaired. Well, seeing as the, the turnover in glass seem to be about 800,000 glasses per year, 5% of that represents about 40,000 glasses a year. Well, that's not the work of an itinerant craftsman. And one suspects that if those figures are anything like right, um, that there was actually an, an industry um, involved in collecting broken glasses, not just for uh, recycling, but for um, repairing and reuse. And a number of in inventories um, talk about broken glass in the parlor. And clearly the people drawing up those inventories um, felt it was worth recording that there was broken glass because this was something of, of value. And there's also um, customs details of uh, shipments of broken glass heads, as well as shipments of broken glass. And broken glass um, had its own customs rate. So, so clearly uh, trading that was fairly common. If we now go to the 18th century, um, it's not uh, amenable to um, the same kind of glazier type repair. So here you've got wood turner repairs. And one wonders about the motivation for these uh, repairing these glasses, because it's not obvious that people um, used and valued sets of glasses at this period. Um, and these seem to be very ordinary uh, glasses um, and not what one would expect as being heirlooms and uh, uh, something that one needed to repair to keep in the family. But presumably there was a, enough associations with the, with the pieces uh, to make it worthwhile going to the trouble of getting them repaired. 
And, and then now moving on, I, I was struck uh, looking through a Sainsbury's in a Sainsbury's store, store I came across um, these tumblers and labeled up recycled tumblers. And I thought, well, the recycled probably refers to the fact that they're made of recycled glass. But I wonder whether the designer realized that they were also recycling the pattern, the style of the glass, because this one on the right is from about 1650. And to me and my eye, that is a modern replacement of exactly the same glass where the simplicity of style um, provides um, a classic utility for the vessel. In this case, the, um, the designer um, probably was not aware that, that they were reusing styles. But in this particular one, um, here the style use is, is deliberate and even including making fake iridescence, um, chemically induced iridescence, to give the impression that this uh, piece had been buried. And I think this, this is um, arts and craft period, um, possibly from, from uh, Lutz, possibly from an English maker. Um, it's not a period with which I'm familiar, but very much wishing to um, connect with the good old days as Ian Hislop uh, maintains and with a, a feeling of a better day or better craftsmanship in the past. Going away now from just glass itself, some year or so ago, I was amazed to see this, the picture on the right here, um, for sale in, in, um, on eBay, because I immediately connected it with this picture on the left, which is um, a, a drawing of a, a furnace, probably from the Rosengras glass house um, in Amsterdam in the 1660s. Well, if they got a picture of it, it was a very early use of the camera. Um, and what it appears to have happened, these two are almost identical. I think what's happened here is the, um, the tunnel layer has been removed in favor of separate layers. But otherwise, this is an almost exact copy, as far as I can see, of this Amsterdam furnace. And one assumes that this glass house set out to make um, glass in the manner of 17th century um, production and took the decision that they would actually build as far as they could a 17th century style furnace uh, to achieve that. Um, so I'd love to know more about this furnace, but I haven't been able to find any more about it at all, because it would be nice to know how it worked in detail. Um, and widening still, um, wanted to, to look at reuse um, for making glass making tools. In this case, the reuse of musket barrels. Um, I've been struck for quite a long while that the moils, that's these, these pieces at the end of a blowing pipe, um, when they rarely, but when they were excavated, um, they came out all practically a very similar size. And uh, the size was seven eighths of an inch diameter. And I'd thought for a long while, well, that's some rather strange um, size to make a blowing iron. And then I realized that the, that, was about the, the um, barrel size of a 16 bore musket. And thinking about it, where else would you get a tube about a meter long and the right diameter 
that was straight um, and available at uh, a reasonable price. So um, this particular one um, um, I was trying out in conjunction with the Roman glass makers and uh, Mark found them sufficiently good to order some in, um, in stainless steel and uh, now finds them actually better for a lot of jobs than some of the uh, more modern blowing iron designs. In this case, this one had a wooden mouthpiece, but Mark now uses uh, stainless steel. Just want to, to comment on these, um, the let have the iron on the inside of these moils, which has come off the outside of the, um, the blow pipe. Because these were recycled, um, I talked earlier about the iron problems, but these were kept and recycled, particularly to colour uh, glass green. And um, Merritt talks about um, putting these to one side um, in order to, to deliberately produce green glass batch. And finally, um, a rather strange reuse. Um, in a sense, reuse of the concept of glass making. And this, this um, um, particular text in German um, is from Philippians 3.21, uh, which is variously translated, but is about transforming our vile bodies. And I think glass making was seen as the, the most uh, common or perhaps the only um, art which transformed the base materials uh, into a valuable enduring commodity that does not tarnish, or at least in the best cases, it doesn't tarnish. Um, but this, this um, was a theme picked up for, for rather different purposes uh, by the alchemists who use glass making as an example um, of it's clearly possible to transform uh, base materials into um, gold-like materials, things that don't tarnish over time. So just to conclude, I've highlighted a few selected examples and only a very few, because that's all I've had time for, of reuse and recycling over the centuries. And I hope you can see that reuse happens at many levels, right from the um, remelting of glass, right through to the conceptual um, value of glass, to scientists, um, to religious leaders, and to alchemists, the, the very concepts involved. And the examples I've highlighted, to me, suggest quite a wide range of motives. Um, but concern for our planet doesn't appear to have been one of them. That seems to be a relatively recent thing, um, I, as far as I can see, in my lifetime. But I hope this shows the value placed on glass and glass making across the ages. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, I suspect that uh, possibly the uh, primary motive was monetary <laughs> in the <laughs> recycling. Uh, it usually seems to be the, be the uh, motive, but uh, we have now moved slightly away from that, but only slightly, I have to say. Right, our next speaker is Inga Paneels. I first met her when she came to Sunderland and braved the Northeast with its weather and uh, its glass centre, uh, etc. Uh, and so, hang on, it. 
yes. She is going to tell us uh, about a material journey uh, and what happens to glass, perhaps shaping the future, but also probably drawing on the past as well. So over to you, Inga. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Bill. Um, <coughs> and thank you for having me. So mine's a slightly left of field presentation perhaps, but um, so I'm, present, I'm um, no longer at the National Glass Centre. I'm now at um, Edinburgh, uh, Univ Edinburgh Napier University. Um, so back in Scotland, but I wanted to tell you, um, oh, why is this not working? Oh, there we go, there we go. <coughs> about a material journey, uh, which was a project that I did um, at the National Glass Centre a, a few years ago. Now, I apologise, the going forward is proving a bit problematic. Ah, that's it. Okay. So, um, the mat material journey was an exhibition at the National Glass Centre in 2018, and it coincided with the PhD research I was doing at the time, although there were separate entities, um, which was looking at how um, artists are mapping climate change, really, um, which didn't have a specific glass focus, but um, as part of the exhibition, I wanted to in interrogate that a little bit. Ah, oh, this is... This is, this is driving me nuts okay right you'll just have to bear with me whilst i change these slides so um really what what today is about is, is storytelling about uh, using kind of art objects really to tell stories about our contemporary um predicament if you like so um in the exhibition i showcase three pieces of work and i'll talk to you about three uh, two of those and one of them is the 10 green bottles <coughs> which as a Belgian was not something I was familiar with, but a, um, a children's rhyme um, for UK children. And, and that was a kind of revisit, revisit of a piece I made for the Collins Gallery way back in the mid 2000s when we did an exhibition that focused on recycling practices within, within crafts. And so um, I used um, some of my own domestic glass waste, if you like, to um, come up with an exhibition piece, which were these um, 10 green bottles standing on a wall. Um, and the labels were made up of quotes and interesting facts that related to glass recycling. And really they were inspired by a visit to a glass factory in Aloha in Clackmananshire um, at that time, which had this kind of interesting hybrid existence. It was part um, Dickensian experience with lots of noise and steam and, um, you know, very, um, very much a, a, a throwback to um, an old way of manufacturing. And the other half of the factory was very contemporary, was quiet, very bright, fully automated and hardly um, much manual labour. So that kind of dichotomy of those two practices was rather interesting. So the, the piece I made for this exhibition was an update of that, really. And then, <coughs> pardon me, is some of the um, some of the um, uh, close ups for that. Now, I'm not a wine drinker. I prefer gin. So I had to um, beg my friends to please drink some wine for me um, so I could have uh, 10 beautiful bottles. And then during lockdown, my son and I came up with a, a did a little animation just to amuse ourselves um, using this particular piece. Things you do in lockdown. <laughs> <coughs> but the piece I really wanted to talk to you about was, was this one, is the material journey. Oh. So this was a bespoke piece I made for the for that particular cabinet in the glass, National Glass Centre um, um, and was made of bullseye glass which by itself is recyclable and um, reusable because it's fusible and compatible with each other um, and what I wanted to find out well what is the carbon footprint of this project you know what what does it actually take to make this piece so there's a, a path of a, a glass boat uh, sit on a water jet um, 
uh, fused piece of glass. So alongside uh, the piece, I exhibited the, the making processes and the, the, the objects, the, the bits of the iceberg that you don't see really, that nobody, when you see a piece in an exhibition, you never see the processes and materials that precede the final product. So um, together with one of our students at um, the University of Sunderland uh, called um, uh, Tom Jordan, we worked together and um, he helped me calculate the carbon footprint. And then this whole piece was collated in 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 a in a in this sort of poem text, if you like. So this little boat set out on a journey, its material journey from ideas to work in progress to final finished work took many forms of energy, of thinking power, designing, drawing, problem solving, and researching, of manual making power, of shaping, forming, wiping, grinding, polishing, and cleaning. But what I wanted to know was the other embodied energy of the material journey in the making of this little boat. This journey took us down the rabbit hole of carbon footprint calculations. As someone said, know the beginning before the end. But this boat was on a mission and disappeared down the hole, the sinkhole, the plug hole. Embodied energies, the embodied energy in the material. Who counts what is emitted? Plaster and molochite. Wax, silicon rubber, water, sheet glass and granular glass. The indirect emissions of energy from materials in melting, steaming and firing. Embodied energy in materials moving from one place to another. Me moving from one place to another. Travelling, journey woman. Indirect emissions from materials moving, travelling from one place to another. Who counts? What is emitted? Indirect emissions from being somewhere here in a building with lights on and heating. So here we are, a little boat, embodied energy, embodied material journeys, 428.62 carbon kilos, visualised a little glass paper boat, a crashing wave, a plug hole, down the rabbit hole we went. 428.62 carbon kilos, one tree, say it grows for 20 years, will absorb 455 kilos of carbon in its life. Or maybe over 19 trees growing in one year will absorb this carbon footprint. Down this plug hole, a material journey, a map barely explored. One material journey, one tree, know the beginning before the end. <laughs> so that was the piece I um, I exhibited there, and then I wrote a, an an article about it in in this journal here, and it's 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 open access, so anyone can can read it uh, about the difficulties in trying to actually find out the details of calculating um, the embodied uh, carbon, um, and I um, yeah, and that in itself is a collaborative effort because none of that information is readily available. But really what came across at the end of that exercise is that most of the energy didn't necessarily go into the glass, but it went into the, the traveling and the journeying and the transport costs. So I thought that was quite interesting um, to see that actually most of the carbon footprint, if you like, was not glass related, but was all the paraphernalia around it, the energy of keeping a building open in the glass center and the energy of me traveling to and from the glass center. So, um, and as I said, the glass in itself that I used was fairly, um, um, ener what's the word, was pretty recyclable in itself anyway as, as as a fusible piece of glass and I think as Colin already pointed out in his in his talk earlier um, glass has has a long and strong tradition of being recycled and now we of course know um, we do that for slightly different reasons so in terms of storytelling why is the storytelling important so as you might know um, later on this year COVID permitting, um, the United Nations will hold their uh, annual COP, um, the, um, <coughs> the annual climate summit in Glasgow in November. 
And the reason I'm telling you this is because I wanted to bring it up to date and round our, our kind of ongoing dialogues about the value of recycling. So the, U the UN and the COP in itself um, really to a great extent determines what our nation states come out with policies and come up with directives in terms of what we as creatives, as businesses can do and what, what that then means, um, how we might have to regulate ourselves. So probably everyone has might hopefully has heard of the sustainable development goals um, as part of the kind of tangible measurements that, that we go against. So what does that mean then for us as small creative businesses? Well, it means new laws, new policies, new regulations, more importantly, no longer business as usual, um, but also new economic and business opportunities, we hope. So um, again, to pick up on Colin's um, talk earlier, the, the use of recycling uh, will become more and more prominent and, and glass, as we know, has, has a, a strong pedigree there in terms of a, um, a sustainable material, particularly if we can use our energy and transport costs um, from renewable sources. So if we want to go uh, towards new economic models, although arguably they're perhaps old economic models that we're returning to. So one of the economic models might be the donut economics, which argues that our economy should not be linear, but should be circular, um, a circular economy that works within ecological ceilings and on social foundations. And I think particularly the circular economy that starts to think about where our materials come from, where they go to and how they might be in a kind of infinite loop of use. And again, um, Colin set that up beautifully, you know, that, that that's not something we're, it's not unfamiliar to us when we work with glass. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, so one of the things I've been looking at that are related to that and really came out of that material journey project was the quintuple bottom line because um, we're no longer starting to think about um, glass as a product that generates profit but we're also starting to measure on how our what our impact is on people um, at the planet um, what the purpose of your business is and, and and lastly people have also started to explore how that relates to how are our materials informed by our locality. Now for glass, that's quite a tricky one to answer usually because we get our materials from all over the planet. You know, um, um, components are made abroad, um, our raw materials come from all over the planet. And so, it. but I think it's an interesting exercise to think about where do materials come from? And obviously glass making historically was very bound by its place and glass places rose up it, exactly in those places where the raw materials were readily available, whether that was wood for burning um, or, um, you know, lime and, and, and other, I don't know, the chemical compositions and other people can keep me right, but there was definitely a bound by there, the places. So, <coughs> as I said, um, the the, the the material journey really started the material journey project at the national glass center really started to make me think of how we need to start to articulate um the impact of our projects not just in terms of in um um carbon embodied carbon but also how they because that in to some extent um, in discussions with the likes of Creative Carbon Scotland and other organisations is a bit of a red herring. Carbon in itself is a red herring, but it is a useful means of starting to think about the impact that our practices have on, on um, well, environmentally, and then um, expanding on that, just not what's the environmental impact, but also what are the impact on our society of, of those practices? Do you know, do we do we pay everybody in our supply chain um, um, a sustainable wage? Um, are our our impacts um, measurable? Um, not just for for planet and people, but are they also are they also purpose driven? You know, what what is the reason for making these things? And 
again thinking about Colin's piece um, where he showed that beautiful glass with the wooden base and thinking why did people repair that you know what, what, what was the attachment to that particular object and then finally as I said the the, the rationale for thinking about what materials could we feasibly source more locally could we change how we make our our products um, that start to draw lo more locally resourced materials that therefore have less um, travel impact for example so stories in my opinion matter in our material world and telling stories through our materials will um, hopefully get people to think about and because we, we're going to um, require new mindsets if we are to deal with the what people have called the Anthropocene, the, the, the measurable impact of human actions on the environment that are measurable at global scales at many levels, their geological findings, they are obviously impacting our weather systems, etc, etc. So if we are to halt that and change those, then we need to come up with narratives that tell those stories to people to um, enable that change of mind and culture change to take place. So new, we need new stories. And I am thinking that the speakers coming after me will tell us more of those stories. Thank you for listening. I suspect I will have blasted through this a little faster than I probably should have. Uh, but thanks. And um, I look forward to your questions later. Thank you, Inga. That was very good. And it uh, certainly gives one uh, food for thought. Um, as children, we all like stories. When we get older, perhaps uh, we don't, uh, uh, we mo move into more lurid ones. But thank you very much indeed. Um, that was excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Right. Could I now call upon Gregory? Gregory Ellis, um, also from Edinburgh. I don't know which side of the, the divide, <laughs> but um, he is doing something which uh, I have slight difficulties with. I spent half of my, well, part of my working life making half of the television tubes, black and white and also colored which were sold in this country. So it grieves me slightly that they're all being smashed up, but that's how it is. And thank goodness that Gregory's doing something about it. So please tell us. Hi, I'll just start sharing my screen. Right, it's not letting me share my thing. So I'm going to freestyle this and talk about what I'm doing. So why, um, so I'm, um, I'm a glass artist and engineer working in, um, working on a first year PhD at the Edinburgh College of Art, which is um, part of the Edinburgh University. Uh, and my PhD is looking at art studio practice and studio art glass um so what i'm what i do is i make pieces of glass that look like this um and why bill is so concerned is because they are old televisions um so not always been a glass artist um and i recently did an mfa at uh, the edinburgh college of art and i was reintroduced to CRT glass as a, a source of material. I had been about 10 years before that I'd been in Stourbridge and I'd seen somebody use it and I started to use it as a hobbyist. 
when I started to take glass more seriously, I was starting to look for um, a new colour in glass and a new type of glass to use. And this was, and I came across this, the CRT glass again, and it, it found new meaning in terms of a material investigation. So how I get it now is I get it from the recycler in terms of, um, in terms of little chunks like this. Um, the, the chunks I get are um, vary in size, but when you combine them, you get these lovely um, material, um, lovely sort of, uh, com they combine and you get, how am I gonna put this? You, they, you get an amazing amount of um, contamination and texture. So using this glass um, is, is sort of, I initially used it because it was a low cost material. Like many artists, I'm always looking to keep the costs down. But then I got interested in the, the life cycle of the glass and the fact that this glass had a previous life. And the fact as glass artists, as, you know, as Inga pointed out, that we're all going to have to find new ways of working, new materials to use. Um, the raw materials that you use to, to make glass are running out. Sand is um, used in many other industries, and glass industry is probably the least user of glass. So we're going to have to find new ways of doing it. So glass artists do recycle glass. I was interested in the CRT glass because it was a more um, unusual type and approach to recycling. Uh, and it gave me a sort of unique color. And as an engineer, I found it a, um, a unique puzzle to solve. Um, I'll stop talking now um, because my slides are not working. And, and if you have any questions and any, if you want to talk in further detail, we can talk later. Thanks very much. Right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, look, we have some time uh, between now and when Hannah will be giving her presentation. Uh, do you have any questions? If you have, put your hand up. It sounds as though we do not have any. David? You have your hand up? You have yours, Inga. Inga first. Okay. <laughs> right. um, Ladies first. <laughs> thanks, Gregory. Um, yeah, I was interested kind of... Um, to, how do you go about collecting all these bits of um, television glass? I mean, do you, uh, you know, do, do you have a sort of, yeah, anyway, I'm, I was quite interested to hear how you went about the sourcing of it in, and, and with a long term vision, like, you know, not just. Um... Um, yeah, so I used to break them. So I used to break them and wash them. And that was quite so collecting them and the ones that we used to have and going to. Um, the recycling center i nearly said the tip going to the recycling center and <laughs> and um, and collecting them and breaking them up but now i found a recycler that does all that for you and they use their glass um as road aggregates so the glass does have another life um and i've kind of diverted that into my art i'm not the first artist to try this um but um i just became fascinated by it um so it's a lot safer now for me to do it than it was before um i know some artists have collected specific types of televisions so there's a guy that collects bang and olstein televisions and he'll only make glass out of those i'm a bit less picky um because i'm more interested in the contaminated aspect of it um does that answer your question 
Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting that already it's 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 gone into a kind of waste stream and you're kind of diverting it from that. So and and the fact it lives in our roads is is quite yeah, quite interesting too. Thank you, David. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so is there I've read that there's some lead glasses in the TVs is being used to recycle and extract the lead from it by precipitating out, reducing the lead and precipitating out the metal, lead metal is, is mm -hmm. have you heard of that? I've heard of some people taking components from televisions and doing that, but I don't, I've not contacted anybody that does that as part of my research. It's, At that uh, point, David, uh, I, could I interject? People uh, um, are doing that, yes, I've heard of it. They'd be far better using the lead glass as lead glass because if it's Philips, if it's anybody of reasonable note, it's 32% lead. There are four different type, or five different types of glass that they use in TVs, um, but one of them as lead glass, and it's 32% lead. Everybody used that because it was standard. Right, uh, just as an extra question, Matthew Demon in the Q and A's, is, is, is that a funnel, uh, funnel or, or panel glass that you're using? Um, do you know which, is it the face plate? Using yeah. the, when I was first breaking them up, I didn't understand there was a difference. Um, and the recycler doesn't make any differentiation between either the funnel or the plate. It would be interesting to actually try that as an experiment. I'm quite interested in the contaminated aspect of the glass. And the, so um, that might give me something to play with. Can I ask you something? Because uh, when I taught in Moscow, uh, they had, they were short of glass because they didn't have any, you know, uh, they couldn't buy glass from abroad. And they use it, you know, this uh, glass, what you use, that it's from screens, from TV. Uh, and this glass was really very soft, very nice that I work with this glass and I really enjoy. But when I came home, you know, I found that, you know, I can't buy, you know, this glass. Would you be able to let me know when I can uh, buy, you know, this glass? Yeah, I can let you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You message me and I'll message you back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that this be... glass is very, you know, very good quality. Maybe not color for some people, but for me was quite interesting because usual was very smoky, yes? Yeah, I love the smokiness of it. Yes. yes. Me yeah. too, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How you read off of this glue, you know, which is on the edges, usually on the edges? Lots of scrubbing. Ah, okay. Uh, the, the recycler does that all for you now, so that's... so. Ah, did they it clean scrubbing. it this properly, yes? Yeah, yeah. It's still... You still there's still some um, residue on it, but it is... Yeah. Uh, do you use, you know, glass from different different screens because I understand that they have different quality or different uh, ingredients and in this case if you use you know how you found you know is it problem with uh, compatibility or not um, the, the stuff that I use is from all different types of screens so I kind of embrace the incompatibility um, and I don't think the incompatibility is enough to break the glass. And I haven't had anything degrade significantly over four years. But did you check, you know, uh, if it's any stress in your glass when you produce or, you know, any, any problems or you never uh, thought about this even? I've put it up against filters to polarizing filters to see what the stress is. And it doesn't really appear that much different to normal casting glass. Mm -hmm. Okay. That really interesting, you know, that how, you know, it's happened that uh, they did similar glass for the screens. Yeah, agreed, yeah. Okay, Hi. thank you. Hi, Greg, thank you. Nice to me. Hi. 
Hi. Sorry, it's a shame about your um, presentation. Um, but I guess what is interesting to talk about, perhaps, is um, the fact that CRT as a resource is a limited and a finite resource now because they don't make CRT television screens anymore. So I think I think it might be interesting for you to talk a little bit about how how that resource will come to an end, and then perhaps within your research how you might consider using other other sources of glass. So I know that we've spoken about LCD, plasma, and then you've been looking at other other things, even to like fluorescent lighting tubes. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, Greg? Yeah, I had the fluorescent lighting slide in the presentation that was unfortunate because that gives, it's quite bluey green. Um, it's quite a nice little, um, it's quite a nice color. It's a lot clearer. Um, yeah, so I think there's a life cycle. I think I used to sort of quote a figure that I've probably got about five years of doing this before um, before it runs out. I'm not entirely sure how accurate that is. But the idea was to um, look at LCDs, um, the glass that's used on LCD TVs and on, on phones as a different source, always keeping with that unconventional materials theme. Um, and yeah, so most recently I've been looking at the fluorescent tubes, yeah. Uh, do you know who used this glass? You know, it means, you know, that it's only artists or, you know, it's another uh, businesses, you know, use this glass? Is it market for, the, for, uh, for this glass? Well, this is, yeah, there was, as I was saying earlier on, the, um, so mainly now the people that, you know, these TVs now have value. So the actual glass in them tends to go into road making materials. So it's like a base and aggregate for road making or into, uh, sometimes they're going to concrete blocks as, as a replacement for um, power station ash mm -hmm. that they used to use in sort of precast concrete blocks. Ah, uh -huh. interesting. But now, you know, that for example, now, because I understand that it is some, you know, uh, interest because, you know, if somebody cleaned this glass and prepared it for you, it means that, you know, it's more people like you who want to buy this glass, is it? It's still quite difficult to get hold of because they're interested in selling in bulk. Mm -hmm. So, um, and... I, yeah, it's, it's just, glass art making is, is a really small market in, in terms of the global economy of glass. Um, it is such a small percentage compared to um, the, the, the ubiquitous use of glass all around us. Um, so people want to sell these things in bulk and even the recycled materials mm -hmm. they want to sell in bulk. So it's quite difficult to break into that. Um, and that's really the, apart from the, as Jessamy pointed out, the, the sort of the fact that this, this has got a limited life cycle, that has been my sort of biggest problem with this type of glass. Mm -hmm. Okay, but general, did you hear anything that any another business is, is interested in this glass that uh, we can lose, you know, uh, years, you know, because they will buy, you know, more uh, more of this glass. Um, you know, like like I've said, it's you, the I've not heard of. I've not heard of anybody directly marketing it to glass artists. Mm -hmm. okay. well, apart from the fact that they sent it to us at ECA. Um, so it was a Scottish firm who posted a sample to me and I passed it on to Greg at his MFA year thinking it could be quite an interesting project. So I guess that they marketed it in that they sent us this sample out of the blue, didn't they, Greg? Yeah, but then they weren't interested in selling it on. I had to find another route to it. Yeah, I think they kind of felt that you were like a, a kind of small, they wanted to sell it by the ton. <laughs> yeah, it's a small business thing. It's yeah. like when I actually went to their place. 
Yeah. How much do you have to take? I've forgotten. Um, so I actually, that, that I had to buy, initially I had to buy 300 kilos. Uh-huh. Quite a lot. Um, How much? 300, 300 kilos. kilos. Wow. This is the smallest amount, yes, which you... Uh, yes. Oh, my God. What does it cost per kilo? It's about... Um, it was probably about a pound a kilo. Uh -huh. Which, in comparison to... to gaffer crystal or or bullseye crystal which is probably gosh that 10 10 pounds 20 pounds a kilo it's hugely different isn't it yeah yeah mm -hmm. and it's very good glass you know right but ladies you know, and gentlemen thing that you know in in russia most of students work on this glass it's very interesting to know i didn't know that exactly because they they don't have any res another resources you know this was reason the difference between the east and the west uh, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah right thank you thank you gregory thank you goshka can i now call upon uh, hannah gibson please to um boot up her presentation hannah is also into uh, recycling of glass and uh, this is a sweet nothingness. Is this what one whispers in one's lover ear, lover's ear, I wonder? Hang on, I am, I am here. I just seem to be having a bit of a problem. Give me a second. Um, give me a second. Can you see my screen at all? Yes. See your browser, yes. Can you see that? Yes. yes. Perfect. You're on. Perfect. So I'm, I'm going to lower the tone of the whole thing now, I'm afraid. So, so I apologize in advance. But um, I'd, I'd like to say, first of all, an enormous thank you to the Society of Glass Technology for providing the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a project that I began working on six years ago now, which I called Recycling Narratives, Whispering Sweet Nothings. So here's the lowering of the tone. So by way of an introduction, um, my name is Hannah Gibson. So here's a self-portrait drawn at the age of three. So even at the age of three, it was evident I wasn't going to make it as a conventional artist. Um, so to provide you with a little bit of background, I spent my formative years growing up in North Wales and with the sea in front and Snowdonia behind, it was hard not to develop a passion for geology and geomorphology. So I went on to study geology at the University of Edinburgh. So you might recognise Arthur's seat in the photograph here. Um, quite early on in the course, we undertook a mapping project to investigate the geochemistry of tertiary volcanics in Mull. And the closer I looked at igneous petrology, the more it ignited my passion for geology and consequently this amazing material glass. So just after I graduated, I took my first course in glass at Edinburgh Stained Glass House. And then I took the well-trodden path of working with stained glass, fused glass, lamp working, and now cast glass. So several careers later, in 2015, I went on to study for an MA at the University for the Creative Arts in Farman, uh, returning a year later as artist in residence. So during my time at UCA, my focus was on experimentation. So to be able to interweave geology and glass was just amazing. So during the, my time, during the course, I began working on a series of um, uh, cast glass figures. So, which are called recycling narratives. So initially, hang on, start my video. Yep. So initially, um, I used the loss wax casting method. Um, hang on. So each cast glass figure became called a sweet nothing. So the collective noun for these are whispering of sweet nothings. Um, so but by keeping the shape the same, um, an easily identifiable shape, androgynous that could androgynous shape that can hopefully bring people together. So my focus was just on materiality. Um, so my work divided into three strands. So the first, leaving the cast glass figures out for people to find and keep. 
but that's a different story. So another one was building this collection of sweetener things made out of other artists' glass, um, other artists' recycled glass to be kept and exhibited together. Um, and the third part was focusing on casting with various types of increasingly challenging types of recycled glass and pushing the boundaries of the material and trying to make my practice more sustainable. So this here is one of the first 26 centimeter tall cast glass figures I made, and it was made out of recycled bullseye glass. So I, I just cast um, pieces that I'd previously already fused. So here we have um, a whispering of sweet nothings, um, the growing collection of whispering sweet nothings. So we, as I said, I started working on it in 2015. So each cast glass figure here is made out of a different glass artist's recycled glass. Um, so each is the same size and the same shape um, and irrelevant, and that's completely irrelevant to if the artist has worked with glass for two months or 20 years. So everyone's equal. So the figures are all 26 centimeters tall and weigh approximately 2.7 kilograms. So as I mentioned, the, the aim is to keep growing this collection of cast glass figures and it's a way of bringing the world of glass closer together. So here we have um, David Rieke's um, Sweet Nothing. So he, is, he established the um, Contemporary Glass Society, um, an eminent glass caster. And so he uses Starbridge crystal. So, um, so, so that's beautiful Starbridge crystal in there. So completely differently, we have um, Bruce Marks, um, Recycle Glass, and he works at London Glass Blowing, and they have Kugler Glass there. Um, so it's a blowing glass, which is tricky to cast with. But it's a challenge, but it's rewarding. So this is Bruce Marks. Louis Thompson, who um, again works at London Glass Blowing, so a completely different color palette. We have James Devereux here. Um, it's recycled glass, and he established um, Devereux and Husky with a delightful Catherine Husky. So this is Katie Husky's sweet nothing here. We have Thomas Petit, um, Helga Watkins Baker, and Katie Young, who established the glass hub in Trowbridge. We have Opal Seabrook, who uses um, spectrum fusing glass. Uh, the delightful Roberta Mason. Adam Aronson, so this is the back of his figure, which is copping cold works all the way from 80 grit all the way through to Sirium. Um, Max Jackard, the amazing glass caster based down in Kent. Um, we have Colin Reed here, who uses optical, beautiful optical glass. Um, Catherine Schilling, who's a fuser and a blower. Uh, so this is recycled bullseye glass, again, using her offcuts. Here we have um, the delightful Ian Chadwick, who's um, ready for a night out. Um, this, so this cast glass figure here has been made from recycled glass um, from Elliot Walker. So he was the recent winner of season two of Blown Away. And together with his partner, Beth Jade Wood, they set up Blowfish Gallery. So the idea is to have this growing collection of figures and people have, so many people have taken part and they might be based in Australia, North America, across the UK, but essentially worldwide. So this cast glass here, figure here was made from recycled glass collected by Michael Bullen um, after the 2019 Northlands Conference. So moving on to um, another part of the project. So over time, I've been trying to work with increasingly challenging types of glass and pushing the boundaries of the material. Um, and alongside this working in scale, on scale, so the sweet nothing figures range in size. So the smallest there, three and a half centimeters, then 8.5, uh, 26 centimeters, 27 and a half, and 41 centimeters. And that, the largest there weighing 9.1 kilograms. So I'm trying to upsize this further to about 1.2 meters. I'm working on it. Um, so these two figures here give you an idea of scale. So these are both 41 centimeters tall and weigh about 9.1 kilograms each. So the figure on the left is made from recycled milk bottles and upcycled watch parts. So lots of people ask about inspiration. So for myself, my inspiration lies purely with the glass itself. So my work is essentially about materiality. Um, I did think about showing you these pictures of overflowing glass recycling bins and landfill sites, but we've all seen these and I want to show solutions not problems. And I want to show positive ways humans can move forwards. 
So I, as I said, I would predominantly recycle glass and upcycled objects. So those objects might be various metals or textiles. And with a background in geology, I'm able to consider the chemical composition of various types of glass. So I do try and use increasingly challenging types of glass. So television glass, car windscreen glass, mobile phone glass, glass bottles. But by keeping that shape the same, the focus is on materiality. So each figure is completely unique. So these cast glass sweetener, sweetener things here, I've called through the looking glass. They're made from 100% uh, recycled bang and olive screen screens, going back to uh, Gregory's talk. Um, so the pieces were inspired after seeing uh, John Lewis at Pandan Mill blow some amazing pieces from television glass. So you can see the inclusions on the front there. So I think this for a previous slide, you can see the iron inclusions there. So this figure here is time and tide wait for no man. So these particular cast glass figures are made from recycled milk bottles and upcycled watch parts. So the watch parts were donated from a horologist in Switzerland. So it's challenging to work with milk bottles. It's challenging to work with metal inclusions and it just creates new challenges. Um, so the watch parts has elements of brass, bronze, silver, copper in there. So each has its own different coefficients of thermal expansion, which is problematic when cooling, I like a challenge. So this is casting call um, made from recycled milk bottles and upcycled textiles. And you can see on this um, a photograph here, the finer details from the textiles. So when I start working, um, I start making these three and a half centimeter tall or small test pieces. So in this figure here, we have Chanel number no. five perfume bottles. So each piece carries its own narrative, its own story. Um, so these here are three and a half centimeter tall figures made from recycled Marmite jars. So Marmite jars are a challenge to work with. So the larger the piece, the heavier it is, so more jars are required. Um, and you might find you can calculate the firing schedule for one bottle, but it's not necessarily the same from the same source or compatible with another. So, so it is challenging, but it's, it's good fun. So I upsize these three and a half centimeter, like I said, to eight and a half centimeter. And the larger one here is 27 and a half centimeters tall. Um, so these figures here have been made from silent pool gin bottles. Um, these here have been made from uh, recycled Bombay sapphire bottles. And this is upsized here. So this figure here is 27 and a half centimeters tall and he or she weighs 3.1 kilograms. So this figure here has been made from recycled Neil's Yard remedy bottles. And this is just a first tentative exploration into working with sea glass. So as you already know, it's going to be problematic because each of the little grains, each of the little beads has a different melting coefficient, but it's going to be good fun. So this cast glass figure here was made from recycled mobile phone screens. So never has our relationship with glass been as close as it is today. So, and we touch those phone screens, those touch screens all day long. Um, in a, so in an average of two years, that phone goes from being Scollum's My Precious to Landfill. Um, so it's important to me that people question what happens in the recycling process and what happens to those phone screens. So I'm hoping to open a dialogue about the recycling process and to, so people can ask uncomfortable questions that the metal components in mobile phones are recycled and they have a resale value, but what happens to the glass? So here we have a shattered past. So it's a series of cast glass figures I began working on during the first lockdown. It's made from recycled uh, car windscreens. Um, so I first exhibited it in Colette this year and now in the Habitat Galleries in, in Chesterfield Gallery in North America. So the process for making each cast glass figure is different and these are no exception. And here you can still see the cubic shape of the toughened glass pieces. Um, so the cube's melting enough to um, hold together and still have a memory of that past purpose. So again, this 27 centimeter tall figure is again made from recycled windscreens, but you can see the difference. And that comes from the chemical composition of the glass. Um, cold working at the figures is a joy and a labor of love. So it's important to me that um, to be able to show that recycled glass can still be cold worked all the way through from cerium to um, 
uh, yeah, so from 80 grits all the way to cerium, so to have that high level of polish, um, which is rewarding, um, but it's hard work there. So this figure here, this photograph here, hopefully shows how the figures are cold worked to that high cerium polish on the back. And this shows some of the detailing, the finer detailing of the figures. So over the last few weeks, I've been experimenting, I'm loving it. Um, uh, you know, using casting with recycled insulin vials, um, and almost thanks to a member of the uh, Society of Blast Technology. Um, so this project's even more poignant because insulin was discovered 100 years ago. Um, so another project I've been working on is casting with recycled COVID-19 bottles. So I've called these here Tangible Hope. So these small, uh, robust glass bottles were essential in fighting COVID. So by choosing a shape that unites, I hope to open a dialogue about sustainability and the recycling process. And I, these figures are often found in pairs, whispering sweet nothings to one another. What are they whispering? That unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better, it's not. So I'd like to say um, thank you for listening and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Again, we have something which makes us think. And uh, thank you for that, because the more of the thinking we do, uh, the better we'll be. <laughs> thank you. Right. Um, could I, I ask um, Jill Bolanos Derman to uh, um, come on and have a, a look and to uh, Unless anybody has some questions for Hannah. Okay, so can we move on then to uh, Julie? The uh, world of second chances, where waste material is the starting point and not the end point. As engineers, Colin and I will uh, subscribe to your ethos. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure what's wrong with Zoom today, but... Right. Um, Hi, Julie, it's David here. Um, we've got your presentation ready to roll when you are, so just tell us when you want the slides to come on and we'll do that for you. Perfect. If you want to go ahead, I'll tell okay. you the next slide. We'll yeah. start. Hold up. It's been really interesting to see all the different perspectives and the scopes of, of the approach to recycling. So I'm gonna um, show you a little bit about my background and to understand uh, uh, where I'm coming from and how it fits into the contemporary um, into the con contemporary structure. So let's see if it works. That's the last slide. Is that ready, David? Yeah. If you just put a full screen, that's perfect. And I have, I can check my, the next slide on, on my computer here.
Shall I just start, maybe? There you go. Well, hello, my name is Juli Bolaño Sturman. I'm a Costa Rican artist um, based in Scotland. And I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, how I got here. Um, this is me in my studio at Custom Lane here in Edinburgh, near the shore. And um, I wanna tell you a little bit about the story. Like Hannah as well, I see like a character in each of the pieces that comes to life in the studio. And it's a constant dialogue between the material and how the material becomes, becomes the guide. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, for visuals, I'm a very visual person. I come from this tiny country in the middle of uh, near the equator, full of bountiful, uh, lush nature, uh, wild animals, um, all of this next to the sea. And then I came to the UK in 2011 to do my master's at Edinburgh College of Art. And it was quite a shift in perspective, in perspective literally, uh, with the Atlantic in the middle. Um, I was translating, I am translating constantly from Spanish to English. So bear with me if I sometimes speak a bit confusing. Um, also, as a, as a true Costa Rican, we are very descriptive when we talk and we have lots of analogies to explain uh, things, especially since um, sometimes I understand better with examples. So I wanted to show you a little bit about process and how play methodology is super important in understanding and learning for me. Um, if, next slide. If you press play there. That's supposed to have music there, but. With this project, I just wanted to do, it was a creative exercise where I just uh, collected, observed my surroundings and wanted to do this um, these creative exercise, especially since I, I have an undergrad in graphic design. Uh, this was a fun thing to put together. As you can see, the quality is not the best, but for me, it's super important to document process and how to express ideas through these creative exercises. Next slide. Uh, this was, um, I did a short course in New York at the Art Students League of New York, and it was like an understanding of contemporary art. And I was exposed to just uh, the objects that were around me. And this was a piece of wood that I felt that I was drawn to. And my curiosity told me to pick it up. And it was like uh, my affinity to save stuff that was going to the bin. Uh, I started to recognize that that was an advantage and how to make objects my own. So as you can see, it's like a little thread of, of gold there eh, throughout. So it's just like a like a, another exercise. And eh, next slide. This is called eh, a series of little animals. This was um, a fused eh, glass panel. And it was a beautiful glass panel that I learned about materiality eh, once I was exhibiting at an art fair in Costa Rica. And the heat was so strong that once I took it down, because it was hanging, I put it on the floor very softly and it broke. Of course, it, it was uh, too warm. So it, this accident in quotations invited me to see the potential of this mistake. And once I um, started to look and observe at the beautiful uh, depth of the color and the mixture of, of patterns and everything, I started to see and the glass started to talk to me, telling me what, what it wanted to become. Here you can see that this little piece of, of glass, it, it said, I mean, it sounds a bit crazy to say, but um, it told me that it wanted to be a, the, the peak of, a, of an owl. And with some illustration, um, I paired the pieces of glass with um, the illustration. Next slide. And I got to ECA. I had no previous experience with glass making, barely. I just did a bit of casting and some fusing in Costa Rica before coming to do my master's. And after learning how to, to do the basics of, I was really lucky to be able to, I was allowed to learn all the different techniques uh, thanks to my, to my director of studies that 
in that time, Alison McConaughey. And um, I fell in love with glass cutting and engraving. But also coming from Costa Rica, I understood that uh, materials in Latin America were not that accessible and it was very expensive to import everything. So I knew that I needed to use as much as I could and be resourceful. So here you can see uh, after coming to the hot shop and seeing like all the incredible things that the other students and artists in residence and staff were making on their own time. Um, I always felt drawn to the mistakes in the hot shop, like the ones that people didn't consider beautiful or perfect or balanced enough. So I told them and uh, if they would save these pieces for me, uh, that like Hannah, I was, I was, it was a nice uh, connection there. Uh, we, we, like we see the potential in, in this little, how to say, no, imperfect a bit. So they were between a mix of, of found glass for like beer bottles or the bottle of gin with blown pieces that um, you appropriate in the cold shop. Uh, I imagine these pieces coming to life and dancing as if they were changing their clothes in the morning. So if you put the next slide. Here you can see I'm mesmerized by process and I love a time lapse because it just invites the audience into understanding the thought methodology behind the making and the why. So um, here you can see as if the bottle was dressing up in the morning and, and it was deciding uh, how they wanted to look like. Uh, and if they needed to dress up for a, to, to, to give a powerful presentation, then that would be the, uh, the attire that they would be choosing. Or if they were feeling a bit more mellow that day as well. So it's just like uh, giving human traits to, to these inanimate objects and bringing a little bit of fun into, into the development. If you go to the next slide. So this is the culmination of my degree show project after two years of masters. And um, Jess is there. She, she mentioned when I was doing my development, uh, Jess and Kelly, uh, she mentioned about how I was drawn to to bring things that are precious, uh, bring that possibility of a discarded material that was a bit lost or that didn't feel like it had any um, any opportunity or magic, if we allow uh, these materials to have a second chance, what can they become? So um, this ended up being a collection of 60 non-functional decorative objects. And uh, they were inspired by um, my grandma's perfume collection. She was, she loved and, and cherished these objects in her, in her dresser. And it just, um, I just loved uh, getting all the off cuts and through hand cutting details, making um, objects precious. And then the playful methodology behind playing as if there were Legos to create these uh, one-off pieces. If you want to, uh, next slide. This is one set that was uh, acquired by the Museum of Contemporary um, and Contemporary Art in Lausanne. And, um, yeah, this is a, a very special set. Uh, so you can see a bit more of the collection in my website as well. Next slide. This is the next collection called Solas. Uh, and these are blown vessels with a glass that I collected, like off cuts of, of even the color for blowing um, and how these mix together while uh, blowing uh, the urn-like shapes, vessels. And then um, let's say that the headdresses, the, the, the stoppers were also pieces of, of, of glass that was going to the bin. So it's just like about bringing that, giving that second chance again. Next slide. This is the hummingbird. Um, as well, it's from the same collection. And that little yellow piece at the top was in a cupboard in the glass department for like 60 years. And I think at a certain time it was going to the bin. And I was so lucky that to be able to be gifted that. And it's such a beautiful piece that makes it all come together. Next slide. This is a series called Made of Museum of Artifacts. And it's just a, a world of a imagined uh, cultures. And these are, this is a series of 19 headdresses, headdresses depicting social, what, uh, what civilizations, made up civilizations valued. So um, if you go to the next slide, 
you could see how the discarded glass um, they became like little gemstones that I was decorating on top of the surface and also how hand, hand cutting transformed um, the main structure and the little details into into texture that looked even like textile so um, uh, this is uh, yeah it's quite intricate detail and each piece is completely unique to the next a uh, next slide this is also i wanted to showcase a little bit about uh, the narratives behind each of the pieces and how they have little personalities and um, sometimes they speak in spanish and english like me uh, this is Ita. She was in the window in my studio one day and she was playing Queen Elizabeth, uh, saying hi to, to her to a crowd downstairs. <laughs> Next slide. This is Carol. Uh, this is what I was talking to you about, uh, how Carol uh, decided to, to, depending on the day, she would choose what to wear. And I did a little animation, stop motion animation of her getting dressed in the morning and bringing joy to that day-to-day -day really mundane activity that we do. And, uh, and also I used again, illustration on top to make it a bit more accessible and to invite the audience into understanding, um, uh, yeah, like the idea and the character and to jazz it up a little bit. Next slide. This was some of the work that I did in my residency in India. Um, it, it was a collaboration with uh, makers and fabricators, glass fabricators in Pirosabad, which is a community of, of glass makers like 200 kilometers from, from New Delhi. And it was an interesting opportunity to be able to, well, of course, the, the cultural barrier and uh, translating from Spanish to English and then a translator from English to, 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 in, uh, to their language. And it was quite a, uh, how to say, uh, it was really hard to communicate, but in the end, this was the materialization of, of that dialogue. Um, if you come up close, you can see that we had a lot of uh, uh, misunderstandings, but uh, I wanted to showcase that in that particular um, surrounding and how each body of work is impacted by the time, the moment and time that's produced in. So it's important for me to showcase that in the work. Next slide. This is um, a project from 2019. It's called the Wildflowers Collection. Uh, it was a collaboration with a uh, per perfume house, uh, Jerome Studio. This is an independent perfumer here based in Edinburgh. And I was inspired and in tackling uh, the work through a, from, from scent. So they gave me the scents from their new collection. And then I started to like, understand the layering of how perfume is made and um, as well the connection to how we create a uh, glass sculptures and how it meshed with my work in that in that instance and also um, I, it was challenging to imagine like how can scent be materialized and then I, I tried to do this by using discarded glass and layering to create stunning um, new layers with with hand cut details and a, this a collection ended up being like 21 pieces as well next slide here you can see two in detail and uh, since i've been traveling every time that i travel to either glass schools or courses or workshops or to anything people have gotten to know me and they always offer me bits and pieces of glass and it's such a um, people are so kind and so it's nice to see that each piece has a particular provenance and how a, I just, I'm just happy to be the translator of this piece to become whatever, whatever, like the wonder of the possibility of what it could become. Next slide. And this was a collection that I developed over a lockdown after a year ago when, um, when we got, well, we had to do the self-isolation at home. Of course, it was a, a lot of time to, to stop and to think about the structure. And it was a tough time because of course, not being able to access our studios. And um, I decided to enroll in a course called Dutch in Virtuals uh, based in Eindhoven. Uh, it was a short course of 
three months and a basically motion design, but they told us to focus on our locality, a, our community, what can we source directly that's close to us. And um, because the structure is shifting because of the pandemic and a, how can we focus on the positives and a, invest into our lo locality and community. So um, this is the project, it's called Powerful Ordinary Bonds. And since I didn't, I usually um, get access to the, to the art college uh, studios and facilities, which have made all the difference to be able to develop my work in the past eight years since I graduated. And then I only own one of the machines, which is a small one in my studio. So I had to be resourceful and think, how can I pivot from these and by using, after I've collected many glass pieces for over the years and done hand cutting details, like these little gems that are like uh, running around my studio on their own. I was just like, how can I, uh, how does, how did the pandemic affect my perspective and how is my work going to be pushed and how is it gonna evolve from here? So um, I start to look, I don't just uh, save glass. I Every time that I see waste material, I'm drawn to it because I, I'm hopeful and I want to give consideration to these poor lon lonely objects that are, that are around there. So um, you can see here rubber bands. Uh, usually when I go and buy broccoli at the, at the supermarket, uh, they come with a brand new um, rubber band. And once you, you buy it, you get to the house and you throw out the rubber band. Well, what do you do with all these uh, materials that are brand new? they are going to end up in landfill. So that drives me crazy a little bit. And, um, and I decided to, to bring them into the studio and to, to repurpose them. Um, also, I think it's just like an interesting perspective on like poking our, our authentic view of what is precious in, in the mixture of the materials from cast glass or pieces of, of, of glass, like the green one uh, to the right hand side. Um, that's a piece of, of, of a crucible a glass that broke off a piece and then a hand cut detail, a pink little petal, hand cut beautif beautifully, uh, very delicate and then attached together, um, not in a permanent way because of course rubber bands break, but it's like a, it's like a, it's like a uh, challenging our perceptions in that way as well. That why does every, every artwork have, has to be permanent? So it's a transition. And also, uh, if you go to the next slide, um, these, my, studio, my studio building was being refurbished and they took out a bunch of uh, copper wire from this building that has been like 60 years uh, un, unused. And uh, this red wire on the, on the right hand side, uh, it's, it's beautiful. And it was all going to landfill. So I just took some bags of that and started to put together what I what I'm usually used to uh, approaching my sculptures by gluing them together, um, and uh, so I tried to put them together this way, either with with the copper wire or with some plastic straw-like material, um, and uh, it just uh, I was surprised to see like uh, the importance of of. Uh, challenging our, our perceptions and how our practice can evolve from this. But the center thing is uh, the studio is a place where, where per perceptions and the critical brain is left outside the door. Uh, here, we are only, it's just an opportunity to play like we did as we were children and, and discover places that we never knew, knew before. Sorry about that. Um, and um, if you go to the next slide. And this is the commission that I've been working on for the past uh, six years. It's been delayed a bit. It's for the Royal Edinburgh Hospital. It's ready to go. And here I wanted to showcase like how um, glass collected by the, by the community of the Royal Edinburgh Hospital, which were the psychiatric patients that I did workshops with, uh, brought to my studio and I collected more from the community. I created these sculptures and how these sculptures uh, come to life using beautiful little light fixtures. So this is my biggest commission to date. It's two light boxes of, of two meters by two meters. And it's like 
40 pieces that come to life uh, with light. So if you go to the next slide and press play, you can see the, the commission in, in like, does it have music? Well, it's supposed to have like really nice music that goes to the to the beat. But here I collaborated with a with an animator, and it was about the telling the story of uh, where each piece came from and paying like let's say like paying the respects to what it what it was, but also appreciating the possibilities of what it can become and the beauty of that process and showcasing a uh, yeah like bringing like the humanity of of that spirit into the sculptures and connecting to to for people to enjoy that and hopefully in the future we give more opportunity more opportunities to to waste material because uh, we don't have any more raw material do we so for me as a maker that's super important So thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. Yet again, another presentation which taxes our brains, uh, which is a very good thing during lockdown because in some circumstances we can't tax our legs. <laughs> Any questions? I guess it's an observation um, between Huli and um, and Hannah, and I think this this word challenging and challenging their work through materials, which I think is really really interesting. And I think for me that sets the scene. Um, but a question to Huli would be: um, I know I, I know you pretty well, Huli, from from yeah. the day. But, so it's lovely to see you, and really lovely to see your, your recent work. But, you know the way that that you come to to the material i think is really fresh um and i guess to connect with sustainability has been such a huge part of your practice um how do you feel like you'll move forwards um with that theme well i think it's interesting because uh, since i come from latin america we're used to i mean things sometimes the structures are a bit more a uh, wild if i can say and we are culturally, we are used to like uh, being super inventive because it's not as easily accessible as in the first world to just let's say, if you need a re uh, is something to repair a machine, you just uh, buy it. For us, it takes a long time and then the expense of, of bringing it over, the taxes and everything. So we just might be a bit resourceful in that way of just giving it a go and see what happens. But I think I, I am guided by my curiosity and I'm constantly challenging myself um, allowing that space for exploration and for the work to be poked and challenged constantly. I, I think it's super important to allow the, ourselves that space, but uh, with the ethos of sustainability at, at its forefront, let's say if I, I don't allow myself to create just because I can, I think as designers and makers, it's our responsibility to, to to put everything and anything that's out there, like what Ingi was saying about the actual cost of production and the carbon footprint of what we do. It's just, it was just such an interesting exercise, an exercise of something so small and so precious, like the little boat and it, everything and anything has a cost. So for me right now, I'm just trying to focus on a, trying to locally source, a, like observe my surroundings, my community, what's happening around me, how can I connect with makers or, or designers, collaborators that are close to me, um, how can I use material that's as well in the community instead of being like, oh yeah, I'm going to buy some uh, glass tubing from China and import it, but what's the actual cost of that? Um, it might be that I'm not paying for it because it's not as expensive to, to import, but actually it's the people in China in the production uh, processes that are paying with the poor quality air and poor quality of water 
and all of these things. So it's I think it's a it's an exercise in, exercise in in being a bit more thoughtful and considerate towards like what are our consumer habits and um, so yeah the work is always challenging that and and giving that space to to be like oh I made a mistake okay how can we course correct and inviting the audience to under to to question these things as well not just about being like oh my chair broke I'm gonna have to throw it out no you can fix it so um, the possibilities are, are going back to mending which is a an important a super super important um, uh, part of my ethos as my studio practice but also like uh, our connection to our well-being and and connection to our our forefathers and foremothers about um, that need to create something with our hands and how that keeps us grounded. And uh, now we're just, we just say, oh, I'm so busy, I can't do anything. But then again, in lockdown, we realized the importance of the arts and connecting and connecting to that, that present moment. And uh, the, the, my practice is, a, is a, um, it's an observation process that's constant. And I think um, I'm not too, too fixated on how is it gonna look like, I just wanna make sure that every object that I create is a, a, a true representation of that particular moment in time. And I'm happy to say that um, from the pandemic and the project that came out of it, it was just such a tough time for everybody that I'm, uh, I'm just uh, thankful to be able to have explored this project in that way and how to move forward from here. So, yeah. That's great, Huli, and and such a strong kind of social commentary for your work, which I think, you know, it, it kind of goes beyond the, the studio glass community and it takes you into this wider stratosphere, really, where people can connect with, you know, your, your themes and, and what's important to you. But really lovely answer there. Thanks, Huli. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Jessamine. Uh, could I call upon... Um... Tira are saying Reese to uh, ready her presentation. <laughs> and uh, it would seem like a number of our presenters, they've, that, uh, they leap between a PhD student and actually making a success of uh, the world, if you like, in the commercial area has been successfully jumped in this particular case. So I await your presentation with, with bated breath. Hello, oh, can you all see this? I can see that, yes. Oh, thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak uh, for this uh, this uh, presentation or this uh, conference. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about from PhD research to enterprise in recycled glass. So of course my, my work is all about recycled glass. And I thought um, uh, it's been amazing to listen to all, all the, the speakers. Um, I resonate with all of you in one way or the other from Inge's uh, uh, carbon footprint, uh, the, the use of recycled glass from the waste stream. Um, I, Hannah Gibson, amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm really impressed with all the different types of glass you've been able to, to, to cast with. I would like to pick your brain on that one day. And Julie, your, your journey was just amazing to see from the beginning and, and how you have made life to some recycled glass. Um, so my, my journey and, and where I start from, um, from this, this path is that I always been interested and attentive to the environmentally uh, part. I grew up with uh, a father who kind of was focusing on saving uh, environmental natural resources and looking after the environment. Uh, I found recently some old drawings and newspaper clippings that I've done about kind of saving the, the, the earth and all that. And I also always been quite artistic and, and creative. And when I kind of was growing up and thinking, what should I become and what should I do with my life? I, I varied from the architect to the artist and kind of finally concluded with product design or something that I felt comfortable with. 
and I uh, started uh, studying product design in Norway, where I'm originally from. And then I came to Swansea to kind of complete my, my degree in product design. And during my third year of my product design degree, I kind of accidentally bumped into the use of recycled glass. And the reason I did that was uh, I wanted to make paving slab from, um, for sight impaired people and, and also tourists. And my supervisor at that time said, oh, that's quite a novel, inclusive idea. What about using a recycled material? And I said, yeah, I love that idea. Why not? Um, so I was introduced to the head of school in the glass department at, in Swansea. And um, he was saying, Rod, uh, Rod, uh, Rodney Bender was saying, why don't you just collect some bottles, crush them and put them in the kiln and see what happens. So I did, and I got hooked. So my undergrad um, proposal, uh, my undergrad degree kind of project became my PhD proposal in 2004. This is what I did. Uh, as you can see, I was casting recycled bottle glass into kind of paving slab, casting concrete, trying to share, uh, create a guideline for, for sight impaired people. So this is my, my start. And, and the frustration was that I hadn't had the, 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 the glass background as everyone else kind of seemed to have. And I was frustrated. I was saying, why does this happen with the glass? Why doesn't that happen with the glass? Why can't people tell me? Um, only to kind of realize I accidentally bumped into uh, my PhD proposal. Um, but having come from the product design background, um, my research proposal then became kind of to evaluate the sustainability and the practicality of using recycled bottle glass for, for making architectural products. Um, I was limited to fusion as a methodology. The, the glass department I was uh, affiliated with only had glass kilns, no uh, casting kilns in any way or shape or form. Um, and I wanted to kind of develop a new direction to the use of recycled glass material because back then in the early 2000s, we had a lot of aggregates and filter beds and, and kind of construction material that kind of were hiding all the recycled material and products like glass, glava, glass wool into kind of insulation material. And I wanted to kind of bring it up and into the aesthetic and kind of show that it could be beautiful. And I wanted to create this, and as a product designer, I wanted to create this design material handbook um, to, to kind of use different ways of, of sharing the, uh, the, 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 the different kind of aspects of the material. So this is what I did with my research and my PhD. So you can see I was exploring the, I was exploring the, the, the different texture that I could come create from different kind of fusing cycles and temperatures and different aggregates of the broken glass. Um, I was exploring how I could add colors because of course, if I wanted to create this material handbook, I wanted to have all the different colors so I can discuss with another designer or an architect saying, oh, do you want this color or a little bit of that color, this texture or that texture. So I was using kind of glass frit to add into the, the, the crushed bottle glass to see if I can create all, all the, the glass. And having my artistic background, I kind of used Itten's color theory to mix all the primary colors to, to kind of create so I can control more of the colors. I wasn't in, in demand of what uh, the frits were available at the time. And also uh, it took me down the way of kind of material integrity. Uh, compatibility as glass artists, you all understand uh, compatibility issues. And I had an extensive amount of tests trying to uh, understand uh, if there was possible to create compatible batch of glass. You can see here, seen through polarizing filters that some of the, the test sample I had tried did not have any, any uh, compatibility. And then others, again, you can see here, there is no kind of highlights of, of that. So I managed to understand there was ways of overcoming the compatibility issue. Obviously, um, I want to make architectural products so testing for the strength and, and, and stability was important. I had to compare it against another known material. So I tested it against, um, for example, um, ceramic tiles that I could purchase from uh, B&Q. And, um, 
and um, uh, you can see here that uh, some of the ceramic tiles here was um, weaker uh, in modules of rupture compared to a lot of my kind of test samples that I tried. Um, it all culminated with uh, talking with an architect who had then developed uh, eight different types of colors into a show flat, uh, of which I produced by hand about roughly 10 square meters of tiles that fitted into the narrative of the architects in terms of kind of the aesthetics of what they wanted to achieve. So that was kind of my, my PhD, my conclusion. I was over the moon, I want to start my business, but it wasn't that easy. That was in 2009. Uh, First of all, the world weren't ready to, uh, to accept a recycled glass product in such a way that I was set up to, to develop. There was an expectation that all the glass, recycled glass products should have a low quality and being very cheap because bottle glass was then for free. Um, and it wasn't an acceptance of my products because they were still handmade and quite highly uh, processed. Uh, so I stayed in academia, um, thought that that was a good place to continue my research. I enjoy research. Uh, I wanted to then apply for funding, which seems to be more difficult than expected. Uh, I was a hybrid between the artistic end and the engineering end. Um, and I did various of other kind of type of um, contracts. Uh, but um, starting your own business is about being entrepreneurial, is about kind of seeing opportunities. And this was one of the things that happened back in 2015. Uh, the university I was um, working at, University of Wales, Trinity St. David, uh, were just granted a, a permission to build a new uh, academic building uh, by the waterfront. And I see the opportunity. So I presented um, a research proposal to my university. I'm not going to talk you through all this, but in 2015, I presented a, a, a proposal of which we could use all the different faculties and schools and expertise that we had within the university to create a live case study of which both students, research staff from various backgrounds could get involved into development uh, of the new um, new campus. So to create a, a unique sustainable architectural showcase for the Swansea Waterfront Museum, a, um, innovation quarter. And coinciding with this in Wales, uh, a new uh, wellbeing act uh, was come into force. So sustainability was suddenly at the forefront of everyone's mind and thinking. Uh, it, it, it changed and it added something. And my pr proposal actually changed the sustainability principle for the, the waterfront development and it developed an opportunity for the creative designs and envi environmental skills of staff and learners within the UW uh, TSD to develop for the new acad uh, academic building at the Swansea Waterfront Museum. Basically, this opened the door for creating a uh, project that was aimed to deliver something for the new building. I managed to gather uh, a team of staff from various backgrounds. We had uh, built envi a natural environment, uh, engineering, uh, and, and uh, uh, College of Art, of which had different various of background. You had uh, people who were focusing on carbon footprints, um, engineering in terms of kind of manufacturing, and then architecture uh, in terms of the building and design and aesthetics. And together we created a staff and student research project that kind of moved forward a lot of the, the, the use of the recycled glass. Um, it culminated that it, uh, we had six students involved from different various backgrounds who used their uh, degree um, dissertations to drive forward the overall research project. Uh, opportunity uh, was great because uh, totally different uh, and randomly, you can see here that the materi materiality uh, ideas that was presented to the project management, 
had uh, a various of recycle glass. And this is not actually my work. Uh, it just happened to be very close to what I do. And when I presented my work then to the project manager of the, the development, they really liked the idea of using staff and students kind of work to create this uh, reception desk. And here was also the visuals of the reception desk, how we kind of envisioned the, the architect envisioned this. And this is how it uh, looked uh, installed. And I created the opening for the project to get involved into these. But I also took the opportunity to, uh, to say now or never, I'm going to set up my business, I'm going to do something that I always wish to do. And uh, I left the university and um, got this per permis um, commission to manufacture these panels. It's in total uh, seven panels of uh, recycled bottle glass that has been made. And I thought I will show you a little video that has been created uh, to illustrate the, um, the making of the panel. So this is without sound. Um, but collecting bottles, 3,000 bottles were collected. I rented studio space. Uh, I cleaned it. It's very basic. That's one of the graduate students who, who I employed to help me out. Um, so the glass is being sieved. That's the building that it's been uh, developed. And that's the, the, the test panels developed in the different designs and colors and textures to show to the architects and they could pick and choose which one they liked. And this is the manufacturing process of the, the panels. And then it was installed then at the university uh, just before opening in 2018. So this commission um, was excellent for me. It became my test, um, my test base to see if it was actually space and room and opportunity for me to set up my own business. So um, I started in 2017. I got the reception desk uh, installed. Uh, it was successful. The feedback was amazing in terms of what, uh, what the panels came. And I decided then to set up my own studio. So um, the world had seemed to have woken up to the, to the sustainability and the carbon emission. And, um, and this is kind of my, my glass. You can see it's broken glass put in a flatbed kiln. I did some uh, a little bit of kind of looking in, not as extensive as Inge in terms of carbon footprint. But I found uh, an article of a small glass studio that had done its carbon footprint and I did some comparison in terms of the, the energy output. And this is only the fusing process and the, or the remelt. And if you can see here, uh, I'm using between eight and 900 degrees uh, when I'm making my panels. But in a remelt um, studio, it's between 13 to 1500 degrees Celsius. If I were to create or, or, or have my kiln working 300 days per year, um, I will release about 1.8 tons of CO2 of that year. Uh, in comparison to a glass furnace, which is 31.6 tons of CO2. We're talking about one tons of glass or roughly uh, of this size, 150 panels. If you compare it with, for example, concrete, you can see also that there is far less CO2 released uh, as well. And one thing that is the difference between uh, recycled glass and something that I, I think is incredibly uh, important is that I don't have any additives. There's no resin, there's no concrete or any other inorganic binders. So technically, the glass panels that I make is 100% of glass. It can go back into remelt uh, and, and, and you can kind of recover the, the materials again. But if you kind of add it into concrete, we see a lot of kind of concrete uh, worktops, for example, the recycled glass and concrete or resin. Um, as soon as you start mixing the glass and with resins or concrete or anything, you end up having a lot of, of kind of material waste that in, eventually it ends up in landfill. Um, I recently increased my colors. I started developing various of different greens. 
Uh, you can see here that is a mixture of all the different wine uh, bottles that you can find. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, called aqua. This is like a, a bluish tint of the glass, different greens, dark greens and amber, and of course, normal clear glass. And uh, here is some few examples of what I've done in terms of my business. You can see the transparency. I know that both Gregory and everyone who's done the glass casting, you recognize this kind of crystalline textured surface that is just so fascinating. Um, again, more tiles, which is colored. You can see the, 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 the blend of the, uh, the fritz that I've used in the yellow when the white glass is just white. Um, splashback uh, was installed uh, last year, I think, or the year uh, just before uh, <laughs> Christmas last year. And uh, this is the most recent uh, installation that I had uh, pictures of just the last couple of days. I uploaded the picture actually today on my website with an amazing feedback. The customer here contacted me in the in the um, in the lockdown, and uh, I provided material samples. Uh, I, I they, they provided me uh, the, the the sizes that they needed. It was quite intricate. So the the panels of this you can't see it here, but it has a special little kink hair that it goes in. So it goes straight up there and slightly in because of the cupboards have been fitted in a different way. So the panels then has been water jet cut. Luckily, I have a water jet cutter just down the road for me, as in not mine, but uh, a company that uh, did some uh, detailing. And um, also water jet cut is a research and, and innovation award that was the centenary from Swansea University uh, last year, January in 20, um, 2020. So amazingly, it was just before the lockdown starting to increase. So that's the reception desk. That was the test bed for my business startup. And uh, I've been lucky. I have done some um, award winning that helps my credibility in terms of uh, sustainability. I won the Sustainability Sustainable Academy Award. Um, for sustainable business and I was also a finalist in Wales for the Great British Entrepreneur Award with Creative Industries Entrepreneur of the Year, which shows a quite a good uh, credibility for my business. So this is kind of my presentations. Um, I have focused on being a business and trying to meet the customers and their needs and see if I can create something that uh, the, 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 the customers would love to, to showcase, either in their office, the business, or uh, in their home. I have loads of other kind of artistic expressions of recycled glass. By all means, have a look at my website and the case studies. You can see vases and bowls and, and there's a bumblebees that I made in recycled glass. I love that kind of part. Um, so, with that, I would like to say thank you very much and invite you to do some questions. Thank you, excellent. And it was good news that we do have some young people who are bringing things through and bring, doing things differently. On a purely personal basis, how about a thousand panels to put on my roof? <laughs> Yeah, I need, need some environmental testing and I'm actually uh, set up uh, with three university uh, that I'm going to start a collaboration with doing some environmental testing in acid rain and uh, impact testing and uh, UV uh, to see if the glass is fit for purpose on the outdoor and, and uh, environment. So um, watch the space. We might, uh, I might expand into outdoor in a in a bit. That's so interesting to see your see your work, Tyra. And I think I got an early edition of your thesis to read back in 2009. I think Kevin Petrie was your supervisor and he let me yes. look at it. Um, so I've been following your work for a long time, but um, 
you know, that green glass at the end is just beautiful. I love the kind of divot and veiling that goes through it. And you talked a little bit about the crystalline structures. Um, and I guess that comes between the glass as it's melting. Um, do, you, do you have much more information about, about what's happening there chemically? It, it is actually quite interesting because with the same collaboration, we're looking into the crystalline surface. It's one of those things that I wanted to investigate when I was still an academic researcher, but I couldn't entice enough um, uh, to, to get any research funding. Um, and John Parker actually shared with me a, a very insightful um, thesis about crystallining, uh, trying to extract the, the green, the chromium of the, 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 the vitrified, the vitrified glass. Um, yeah, so it, it is quite interesting. What I do know is that it changed its behavior with uh, the glass. And um, when the glass is incompatible, uh, and it's fused and it still remains in a glassy state, it will uh, more likely to fail due to incompatibility. But something changes between the layers when it starts crystallizing in terms of making the material stronger and more stable. Um, but it is now hopefully to be investigated uh, through some collaborative work with University of Aberystwyth, University of South Wales, and um, Glyndor. So we'll see if we um, learn some more. Mm, that's really interesting. And, you know, having worked, I work a little bit with recycled glass as well, but I can, it's almost, it's so different when you cast it. And you kind of have to, it doesn't cast in the way that normal glass casts. And you've got to really work past that first crusty surface, really. And, and get it on the saw or the water jet and, and it's it's still got that kind of dusty kind of sweaty texture i can't really describe it but it, it, it's really hard to cold work as well it's a lot harder than yeah yeah, yeah it, that is true i've had a few I've, I've tried as a business i'm trying to outsource some of my my processes but finding someone who could polish the glass it's impossible uh Hard work. Through a lot of different companies to see. Um, but that's one of the things that's quite uh, it, weird. And also, um, when people see the glass, obviously they don't recognize this as glass anymore. And it doesn't behave like glass anymore. And, um, and uh, therefore, it's much of an unknown. So a lot of the the material testing and stuff needs still to be tested directly into this material rather than using known mm -hmm. um, known knowledge of glass. Mm -hmm. um, of course, bottle glass is a short glass. It doesn't, it's not designed to, to flow very well. No. So yeah, therefore had, casting it is difficult. So I'm mighty impressed with uh, Hannah's uh, work with uh, the, the casting of all the different recycled material. Mm. Yeah, I think that top temperature can start to change it and get you into a, a kind of less devitted state. As I've had a student that's been casting at about 1200, 1300, a bit like you said in industry, and you can start to get rid of that kind of devit state. Um, I guess yeah. what interests me, because obviously I come from a, a PhD in glass and ceramics, so it's I always view devit as a kind of the, the glass going into a ceramic phase. Um, which is quite interesting. So you start to get the glass kind of re resorting or, or reverting into a ceramic crystalline because glass naturally, I think, is non-crystalline. So you're seeing it go into a glass and ceramic state, perhaps accidentally through divitrification. But I think there's there's definitely lots of research mileage there. So I'm really, really interested. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's still a glass. Um, and even though it behaves and acts more like a... a stone or, uh, or, or ceramic material, it's still a glass. And as far as I understood, it's still quite hydro hydrophobic as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but um, that is quite a lot of technicality that glass artists don't really dip into in, uh -huh. in details. Um, but it, it, it's, it's very in interesting. And, and um, I'm, yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm quite exciting with this collaboration that mm -hmm. uh, we are due to um, embark upon. 
Yeah. Can I ask you something? Because, you know, I understand that you use it, you know, 3,000 bottles, yes? And these 3,000 bottles, they were made in different time, different, you know, places and uh, things like this. That when you fuse them together, because I understand that you fuse them, not, you know, cast them. Yes? Yeah. I am correct? Yes. Okay. That it's much lower temperature. That it means that generally you glue, you know, the small bits of glass together. Yes. Yeah. Okay. How you can give guarantee that this wouldn't crack in two years, four years, you know, something like this? Um, well, I have had the pleasure of done this now for the last 18 years. And I still have uh, samples that have gone through quite a lot of uh, environmental uh, changes in terms of heat and cold and, and, uh, and various of things. And I still have kind of big panels of, of um, test samples through my PhD time of which all of the samples that has gone through this crystallization phase has not have any cracks or damage or failure. Uh, while the majority of all those uh, samples that were produced at the same time with same similar type of kind of bottle batch of, of bro broken glass that I created uh, has had a failure. Uh, I've also did quite a lot of environmental testing during my PhD because that was one of the biggest questions I had. If I were to make something that was reproducible and fit for standards in architectural environment, I needed to make sure that I can say to the architects, this is this is um, this is gonna uh, not break randomly. Uh, so I did quite a lot of tests. Uh, photoelastic stress measurements was one of the biggest things that I did. Uh, I was lucky to have quite a lot of uh, support in terms of, um, and you have to excuse me because this is now quite old <laughs> knowledge in my head. I, I'm gonna have to delete a few um, knowledge here. Uh, but the, it's done like, quite a lot of testing with, with the photoelastic stress measurement and uh, uh, compared against the, 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 the amount of divitrification that uh, happened during the samples and then can see the, 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 the stress levels have reduced over the time, the, or the more crystalline it is, the less stress it is. Uh, that was my findings of my PhD. And then those, all those samples then has been, um, has been then uh, material tested up against a uh, three point bend test or third point bend test to see if they changed in strength in one way or the other. And one of the things that was the most um, uh, indicator of, of, of stability was that the standard deviation of each samples um, lowered for each, uh, for, for the, the more crystalline um, surface it is on each sample. Does that make sense? Yes, but in this case, you know, I want to ask you because, you know, it came to my mind that if it's more crystallized, yes, it's in this case works better because it's stronger or less stress, you know, you can notice, you know, in your pieces, uh, that in this case, it means that this is not any more glass. Because glass, it's, you know, when it's keep, you know, it's, you know, very unusual, you know, um, uh, future, you know, that it's general like fluid, yes. When it's crystallized, it means that turn to like another materials. Yes. And in this case, Experience of the, the as in if you were to. But you lose in this case, you know, transparency, you lose, you know, these futures of glass, yes, general. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't look like glass anymore. That's true. Yeah. That you see, you know, that general, you know, why not to use in this case, you know, another material? Yeah. I'm going to. Are we going to go into the rooms in a moment or two? Okay. As, okay. So we continue as we are. Okay. Right. Could I throw the whole thing open to anyone's questions on any of the speakers? It's a bit of a like a brains trust where we have the speakers. Uh, versus the audience, but not in mortal combat, I have to say, but in a very polite and auspicious way. 
So, yes. Bill, uh, we've got a question from Terry Harper and uh, Brian oh, Clark. Yes. I don't know if Terry wants to speak himself, but I can read out his question. It's in the q and A's. I'll speak if you like. Okay. Hi, Terry. Hi. Um, there are some of the samples you showed were uh, colours like red and orange. And I wondered whether you'd actually tried using any of these and whether you'd found any trouble with keeping the colour when you, during and after you'd process the samples. Are you asking me? Yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the question was that if I'm using uh, the colours, obviously when I, when I add colours, it, it's hard to take the colours out of the materials again. Uh, so so that, that's uh, been made for kind of an end use. What I'm trying to do, um, what I'm trying to do is to create um, uh, colors that is pure in terms of its green, its white, its, 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 uh, ha its heritage. But as a designer, I am trying to make glass that is, um, is what the customer would like to see and have in their home. So, um, and, and, and it's part of it, it's, and it was something that um, Inge was, was saying about kind of um, the stories that matters. And that's part of my, my um, narrative in terms of, of my business is that I want my customers and people who view and listen to, to what I have to say to kind of understand that this is a waste material. And this is something that can become beautiful, something that you would value, something we upcycle. And it adds to the conversation in terms of what can we do with our waste in circle economy. Uh, I'm not uh, even trying to solve any kind of recycled glass problems because I am a small glass artist in, in the end of the day. I'm not solving uh, any problems, but I'm adding to the conversation that recycled glass can be used in so many different ways and making people aware of where their own waste goes. And, and that's most interesting. And very quickly, I'll, I'll mention, because when I collected the bottles for the reception desk, I went into this local pub and asked, um, can I please collect your white clear bottles only, please? And they said, of course you can, it's a skip over at the back, you can just help yourself, but they're all, they're all kind of mixed color as they do here in, in, in Wales. And I said, thank you very much, I will. And then I said, oh, by the way, be very careful. It's kind of sharp and broken. I said, that's fine. Can I potentially provide you with some bins? And you put all the clear bottles in the bin. So I started coming every week, collected bottles for them, from them. Um, and I started talking to the staff, the manager, and uh, they started to recognize me. And they said, oh, I, I've been very careful now putting the glass bottle into the bin so you don't hurt yourself. One day I came back with one of the bigger panels and said, look what I made from bottles from your pub. And the amazement from the staff that they suddenly felt they were a part of the story. And I said, I'm going to make big panels that fits into the university building. And all the staff were just mm -hmm. amazed in what their little contribution of putting the bottle into those particular bins for me. And they felt a, a great achievement in such a way and a few years later actually just before lockdown uh, first lockdown I went back and had a chat with them oh I remember you you had these amazing panels and we are now thinking more and also an uh, unintended consequence that they became more aware of the recycling there was no more plastic going into the the skips there were no more crockeries which is one of the bigger problems uh, glass bottles uh, recyclers have is, is uh, as, a, as a contaminant. So, yeah, that's part of what I'm trying to do is kind of share the story and, and make people care. Yeah, your problem, I think, you know, is when you get different colours, they don't necessarily stay the same when you're heat treating them. Uh, I know you've got sort of uh, different yellows, ambers, clear blues and so on. It just there are some other colors which you look like you might be using. I wonder whether you'd ever gone that way. Uh, what other colors are you thinking? 
well, red and orange particularly? Um, I haven't found a red bottle to use yet. They have usually you won't. Been, uh, <laughs> been, um, laminated with film. Any other questions? And I have one for Colin. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, the, the glass that you showed was from a Roman site. Uh, yes. It had been brought in in, in colored form, uh, bits and pieces. Well, I think there is a, there was another way that the Romans, in fact, brought their glass to Britain, because we have, uh, although we now have no actual evidence, no lumps of glass to show, because a recalcitrant builder, um, they brought the glass in fairly large lumps, not <laughs> cast into ingots, but uh, you know, just balls of glass. And they used them as ballast for the ship. Uh, yeah, it could could well be. Um, I, the, the, um, I, I use the word ingots, but really a lot of it had been uh, breaking up very large slabs of uh, of glass, um, and um, so they could well be a um, uh, used as as ballast and in the same way that the East India Company used saltpetre as ballast, which then turned out to be the ideal alkali uh, for crystal glass. Do you know if any of the other uh, Roman sites have been, have had this type of industry attached to them? I asked at Vindolanda, but uh, they had no, no, had no excavations which showed any traces of glass other than the occasional piece of broken glass, which was obviously a broken vessel. Um, there, there have been a number of, of production sites. I'm afraid my knowledge of, of Roman glass isn't sufficient to, uh, um, to cover it, but I'm, I'm sure... Um, Others can provide you with uh, much more details of what sites there, there have, um, have been, you know, that have shown evidence yeah, yeah. Of, of glass working. Thank you. <laughs> uh, have we had Brian Clark? Brian Clark has a question. Yeah. Um, uh, I'd like to say uh, I've been incredibly impressed with the uh, the uh, presentations from Hannah, Julie, and Tyra. Uh, enthusiastic and innovative, absolutely wonderful. But I have a query for Tyra. Um, you say you're a small glass artist, but with what you're doing, have you considered moving your business forward to a much larger scale, using your techniques for architectural constructions. Um, I'm particularly thinking of maybe partitions within offices or a few years ago being in the northeast of Australia in the Cairns Port Douglas area, they actually used glass panels for walkways into, into the jungles. And you just couldn't tell it was glass. I was completely astounded. So could you tell me, have you been thinking about moving the business forward? Yeah, that's the dream. Um, when I started the business, uh, you, you start with, you're going to have it this big and that's large and all that. And then reality kicks in. I don't have unlimited amount of funding uh, or money to set up. And it's, uh, it's a chicken and egg. Where, where do you start uh, in terms of growing your business? And when reality hits, it's like uh, I have to succumb that I have to grow organically. I have to keep on uh, getting commissions and bigger commissions. And only when I have like a, a commitment from larger scale uh, uh, commitment, I can then look into then find funding 
in terms of um, um, investment of space and equipment and all that. Uh, just for example, looking at equipment for bottle delabeler uh, uh, machinery, I uh, looked into it, it was about 50,000 50, euros. It, at the moment, takes up all my, uh, would take up all my studio space. Um, I'm currently uh, set up in my garage, which was a blessing because uh, COVID, uh, I wouldn't have survived mm. if... Um, if I had um, monthly outgoings of rental space and et cetera. So yes, it is something that I'm looking into, but also something that isn't easy to do. And getting funding is uh, incredibly hard. I have so far not uh, been very successful in the application. It takes a long time to, to develop good applications. Yeah, I was just wondering whether you'd sort of been in touch with commercial construction companies to put your ideas through to them to use your glass instead of using concrete and plastic? Um, I have, and I had a, a fantastic first meeting with uh, Buckingham Group, uh, which is building the new Swansea Arena, uh, literally the week before lockdown. And they were really interested in, in using some of my work in one of the, the VIP uh, rooms for the arena. Unfortunately, lockdown hit. Everyone went into some sort of a panic mode in the beginning. People were worried about the future and it all just disappeared uh, in the beginning of the lockdown. And of course, although construction moved on, the, the, the risk of investing into a small business became too high for many businesses. Uh, now the lockdown is, is uh, kind of easing off. The world is kind of waking up to sustainability in a different way. I'm noticing a lot more interest to, to work my work, which is positive. So um, yes, it is possible, but it is not easy when you're actually sitting there and going to do it. The amount of advice I've been given in how easy things are uh, is amazing. <laughs> but it isn't when it comes to practicality. Okay, Tara, thank you very much. I wish you thank well you. for the future. Thank you. Did Ian Freestone have a hand up a moment ago? Or is that... Um. Sorry. Just a, um, a comment, or just a, a thing which flashed through my mind, uh, like a flashlight thinking it probably doesn't hold any ground. In Dundee, when I worked there, there were a number of retired engineers, many of them been trained by very good companies, including Timex. And one of their interests was old machines. Perhaps you could find that group. I don't, I, I, maybe I might be able to raise them uh, and set them the challenge to make the machines that you want out of scrap material, recycling the machines themselves. Because there's dozens of scrap yards, I can tell you, uh, because I have knowledge of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think. Um, well, that's all the engineering school. Yeah, I. Um, yeah. Um, when I started my business, I, I focused a lot about the equipment. Uh, but what I need to make sure now is to get the, the commissions, the, the work, the interests, the pull from the industry and, and customers to make this happen. Because unless there is an interest for these, this material and this product, there is no point investing in a lot of equipment. So it is, it is a, it's a, it's a fine balance to grow and it's important not to try to run before you can walk. 
Um, and for those of you who are academically minded, um, it is it's a different world uh, to move from academia. Very interesting program. Till or, uh, running a business um, and the amount of said... learning you do in terms of just pricing, uh, production, delivery, installation, uh, customer service, and also all the tax and 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 webs website and all that. It is amazing uh, how how it is when you 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 start from a business side uh, from compared to what it was when I was academic. Um, so yeah, it's 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 coming, but uh, it's it's a uh, it's a journey to go to. And uh, again, I think it's important to to take one step at a time and not trying to run too fast. I've seen businesses that have tried that and failed. So I want I don't want to be one of those. Taira, tell me now because uh, this is really I really like your work, you know, and uh, it's very interesting for me. But you move from academia to business, yes. And what do you prefer now, you know, when you see, you know, how it works both? Um, I, I still love research and that's why I've been kind of setting up this collaborative kind of uh, work with, with a couple of universities. But I also love uh, my own business because when I was in academia, I had so many different um, skill sets around me. And when you're setting up your own business, you have to suddenly trust your own instinct and you have to uh, do what you believe is the best for your business. And it takes time to trust that instinct, especially when you've been told uh, through your kind of career up till then that th you have a line manager, you have like a, 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 a organization that you represent. Um, and then suddenly have to do things on your own and you don't have all the skills that you can just tap into. Uh, it's thrilling to kind of have been able to do it yourself and know that my decisions are correct. Uh, I've been successful so far. And uh, when I was in academia, I was told there was no interest in my work. So therefore that's why you don't get your funding, your research funding, your, 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 um, and I tried through the Innovate UK to see if uh, an architect office or a construction company was interested in to develop this material with me along with innovative funding. There was no interest. That's why I decided I'll do it myself. I'll become the industry, I'll become that business and I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And I'll, I'll prove that all the, the feedback that I got as an academic, it's valid, although it didn't help me getting the funding. Um, so the sense of reward is great and I don't miss and I want to go back to academia yet. <laughs> Uh, tell me you now about finances, you know, because you you were uh, successful with your, you know, uh, uh, projects, yes, and uh, and fundings. But is it, you know, can you see difference between, you know, when before COVID and during the COVID? Oh, uh, yeah. As in, I was just on the upway trajectory before COVID. COVID hit; it went dead for me. Uh, it was very quiet and now uh, the, the customer is coming back and I'm getting new customers and I'm reaching further. Uh, um, I'm hoping to, to get some, some good collaboration with, with um, architects in London now where, where I'm reaching out. So COVID have opened up in, in, in more ways like that. Before I was more focused on the local, uh, local market and now I'm reaching further because people are more used to working further afield uh, digitally, which is good. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, I'm really sorry, people, but um, I want to say thank you very much for um, letting me take part in this, but I, I really have to go. I have <laughs> my son's last day at school and he's just come back from school and I need to go and see him. Me too. Thank school. you so much for everything. Oh, yeah. pleasure. Oh, pleasure. pleasure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See you later. Thank you very much. I will um, have to uh, attend to my family soon as well. <laughs>
Taro, before you go, you are connected to one of the societies with a large volume, large number of grizzly grizzlies uh, who have a, a mass of engineering and technological experience between them. Make good use of it. Thank you. David will be your contact. Thank you. I I, uh, I will do that. Thank you very much. Just before we finish, I would like to say thank you to you all very much indeed. It's been a fascinating afternoon. Uh, lots of ideas of Christmas presents for my wife, which is always a problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's been a very good and interesting afternoon. Um, I will be writing to you all because I think we ought to uh, get something into the uh, Society of Magazines about this afternoon. It's been... Uh, a lot of very interesting material presented um, and also um, I'm going to contact you all to talk a little bit about next year which is the uh, International Year of Glass and an opportunity to um, advertise more widely. John, if I can say something, thank you very much for that comment. It's, uh, I'm the uh, editor of the Glass Society magazines and journals I used to be chairman of the Glass Association, but having listened to everybody this afternoon, I've been completely bowled over with the, as I said before, with the enthusiasm. And I would definitely want to be getting in touch with uh, people such as Hannah, Julia, and Tyra to maybe write some articles up for us for the uh, for our Glass Matters magazine. So thank you for that idea and look forward to hearing from you as well. Thanks. I too would like to thank you all. Uh, a very um, well refined meeting compared with some of the meetings I have had to chair very recently under lockdown. And thank you, David. Things, by and large, the technology has worked. We've proved the point that we wanted to make. And I think we can go on and move on from there. And I look forward to contributions from all of you in the near future. So I second John's comments. Thank you very much indeed, all of you. Right. Bye then.